Hey, welcome back for our continual look at my favorite show of all time, The X-Files. Today we'll be looking at Grotesque, episode 14 of season 3. Debuting on February 2nd, 1996, Grotesque puts Mulder in the middle of a murder investigation where a serial killer believes he's being controlled by a demonic force. The episode begins at George Washington University and poor guy, it must be really cold in there. A group of artists are sketching the nude model and one guy, John Mostow, is really into it. The model even glances over at him wondering just what the hell his issue is. But the guy's a perfectionist. He wants to make sure he gets the ass just right. After cutting himself and using his own blood for what is quite possibly the worst drawing of this poor naked man, Mostow leaves in a rush because it's all you can eat night at the Sizzler. Afterwards, the model heads to his car, which is just in a creepy alleyway for some reason. Does the university not have parking? It doesn't look like he's going anywhere, however, because someone jammed a pencil in the door's lock. Oh, and some spooky figure attacks him with a box cutter. Hours later and Mostow is raided by the FBI, led by Red Foreman. But just where the hell was he when his daughter was causing trouble at school? Up your right to remain silent. Ah! God! She bit me! What is with the murderers in this show always trying to bite people? Amongst all the creepy drawings, Agent Bill Patterson finds the murder weapon and he seems to be really happy that he did. I think he's finally going to get that big promotion that he's always wanted. Now you might be wondering, why have Mulder and Scully been brought on the case? Mostow has been caught so everything should be all good, right? What a stupid question. Because no, everything isn't good. The murders have continued, seemingly caused by a copycat. Because it's generally hard to commit murders when you're locked up. All the victims appear to be young men, with each one being violently disfigured, having both eyes punctured, and the corners of their mouth sliced to their ears. If you count the spirit Mostow says possessed him during the murders. Of course, it's demonic possession. It can't just be a psychopath who wants to slice and dice young men. With Mostow in custody, the agents decide to pay him a little visit, and I'm sure it has nothing to do with him being possessed. Mostow claims this evil force is what killed the men, not him. Although Scully rightfully thinks it's much more likely that he has an accomplice who's carrying on with the murders. Bitches leave. Agent Patterson pulls Mulder and Scully out and ridicules Mulder on his beliefs of aliens and demonic possession. It has been a while since the show introduced someone from the agent's past who's just there to give them a hard time. At least Scully seems excited to meet him because he basically wrote the book on behavioral science, but he and Mulder don't exactly see eye to eye. Agent Patterson seems to take offense to Mulder being placed on the case, but it wasn't his doing. This was all Skinner. Patterson had this saying about tracking a killer. If you wanted to uh, know an artist, you had to look at his art. Based on all of Mostow's drawings, I would say they were a little on the nose with the metaphor. Mostow's studio was filled to the brim with drawings of gargoyles that he was using to protect himself from some dark force, although they didn't really seem to be all that effective. A spooky little kitten gives Scully the fright of her life, but it leads them to a door hidden behind the drawings. Mulder enters with the tiniest flashlight you've ever seen, and instead of following him, Scully just keeps yelling. She's probably still recovering from her cat scare. Mulder! Can you tell me what's going on in there? A short time later, another man is attacked, this time a glass blower. I don't know what this killer's issue is, but he really hates the arts and crafts. Luckily, this guy manages to survive his attack, but they claim he has the same facial mutilations, but his eyes definitely don't look punctured. Patterson's partner, Agent Nemhauser, is starting to have some questions about the agent's involvement. He thinks Patterson secretly asked Skinner to bring Mulder aboard, but for what purpose? Interestingly, when Patterson arrives, the victim starts to react in a very strange way. Mulder is starting to obsess over the case, just like Patterson has for the last three years. I mean, really obsess. Did he draw all of these or steal them from Mostow's art studio? Either way, he's been a busy boy. You know it's hard to have fun with an episode when it's this dark. But what this scene needs is a little Patrick Swayze. Mulder decides to take a little cat nap after his art project when he's awakened by what looks like the haunted mask from Goosebumps. Even though this figure he chases is creepy, it still looks a little silly seeing this demonic figure wearing a suit. Ah! 
Scully by this point is really starting to worry about Mulder. He's never at his apartment, doesn't answer his phone, and it's all because of this thing that he believes is targeting all the young men. Even though Scully still thinks Mostow has an accomplice, Mulder knows what he saw, and what he saw didn't exactly look human. Scully thinks Mulder got dragged into this because of Patterson, and Patterson is the reason he's not acting quite like himself. And when she sees Patterson, well, she charges him like a raging bull. I just love seeing her angry. Is this some kind of a payback for what happened eight years ago because Mulder quit the ISU? My motivations aren't that petty. The reason Patterson wanted Mulder on the case was because he felt Mulder was really the only one capable of solving it. This makes Patterson, what, the fourth or fifth person that has come back into Mulder's life only because they needed something from him. Before Scully leaves the scene, she discovers a blade from a box cutter embedded in the tire of a police car. But that's not all. She also discovers the box cutter itself underneath the car. Meanwhile, Mulder decides to have another talk with Mostow about this apparent demon. You have to help me get inside its head like it got inside yours so I can understand what it wants. Mulder wants to know how he can find this thing, but maybe he already has. His behavior isn't exactly rational these days, and he even punches Mostow, something Mulder generally doesn't do to defenseless men. Meanwhile, Scully takes the knife to the crime lab, and they find some fingerprints on both the blade and the handle, both of which somehow belong to Mulder, not the killer. Or maybe they do belong to the killer. But let's not gloss over those glasses, which are peak 90s fashion. Scully decides to check on the evidence collected at Mostow's place and finds the box cutter he used to commit his murders is missing. So it's likely Mulder took it out, but for what purpose? Both Scully and Skinner are now worried of what might be happening to Mulder. <laughs> he's even beginning to dream that he's in Mostow's nightmare gallery, being attacked by this demonic entity while Patterson and his partner watch on. He's really starting to crack under the whole thing. But what's with the random hand planer on his table though? I never took Mulder for much of a carpenter. Unable to sleep, Mulder heads back to Mostow's studio for some reason. But he does randomly stumble upon a severed arm of all things. Scully gets a message from Patterson's partner, but when she tries to call him back, it's Mulder that picks up. Things are really not looking good for Mulder. She asks him about the missing knife from evidence and his fingerprints, but he claims he just wanted to hold it so he could feel what it felt like, but he definitely did not take it. Anyways, while Scully makes her way to the studio, Mulder notices one of the gargoyles is looking rather, uh, wet, as if it had just been sculpted. Ooh, I bet I know how he got those scars. Well, he found Patterson's partner at least, but as quickly as he does, Patterson is already right behind him. Mulder immediately questions Patterson, accusing him of murdering his partner. I'm sure the fact his hands are covered in clay doesn't help, but so are Mulder's. Patterson got himself a little too deep into Mostow's head, and once Mostow was caught, all that violence and rage he had subjected himself to bubbled to the surface, causing Patterson to continue the slayings. Mulder, what the hell are you doing? <sighs> Scully, get that light off me. Scully suddenly arrives, but this entire scene basically played out in real time. Somehow she managed to drive from her house to Mostow's studio in a little over two minutes. I know I'm nitpicking, but it just makes me laugh. Patterson bulldozes Scully over, and I think she finally figures out that it's Patterson committing the murders and not Mulder. They chase Patterson to the rooftop of the building, but watch out Mulder, it's Carly Beth! <laughs> Mulder shoots Patterson, but I don't know if I should say luckily or unluckily, but it looks like Patterson will be spending the rest of his life locked up. Grotesque is an underrated episode that I don't think gets mentioned much. I think it's partly because of its tone. The episode is a lot darker than most episodes in the series, and a lot more psychological. I enjoy that things aren't just cut and dry. It's not just a worm monster in the sewer, or a man with stretchy limbs. The episode asks the viewer to do a little thinking. Was the demonic entity real, or was it just the imaginations of all those that were involved? Mosto had been locked up in a mental institution for years prior to the murders, so was he actually possessed by a demon or did he only think he was? Patterson had become so obsessed with the case that he could have made himself believe he was also taken over by this same spirit in order to continue with the murders. Devoting every waking moment to something so horrific could have untold effects on one's psyche. I think the only reason Mulder didn't become consumed by it was for one, he had the support of Scully, and two, he had only been investigating the case for a short time, so it obviously wasn't able to have the same hold on him as it did Patterson. 
Also, we did kind of see the demon when it had hold of Patterson, but was that an artistic choice? Was the demon only supposed to be metaphorical because Mulder was getting so invested in the case? I mean, he was surrounded by creepy drawings and sculptures and was also alone in the dark. These things could all come together to play with someone's mind. It could also be like Donnie Faster. He originally wasn't supposed to be an actual demon. He was only shown as one in quick shots because it was supposed to represent just how evil he really was. Or maybe it was a real demon and Mulder was able to handle it before it managed to take hold of him. I also really love the look of this one. All those pictures of gargoyles and demons are really unsettling. The constant darkness with only a hint of blue light really gives everything an eerie look to it. It's really no wonder this episode won an Emmy for its cinematography. The episode was written by Howard Gordon. Howard had become inspired to write an episode about a gargoyle spirit possessing someone after a walk one day down in New York City when he noticed some gargoyles hanging off the corner of a building. Just days before filming would begin on the episode, Howard and Chris Carter sat down and did a complete overhaul of the script, making it more cerebral and psychological than just a straightforward possession tale. Kim Manners would be given directing duties for the episode, and he considers it one of his best of the third season, something David also echoed. According to the official X-Files guide, Kim would play the soundtrack to the underrated psychological horror film Jacob's Ladder over and over until his wife eventually just couldn't take it anymore and said, do we have to listen to that bleeping CD again? Manners also felt the episode was partly responsible for Chris Carter creating the show Millennium, which had a much darker tone. And in the X-Files Confidential, he said, I think it is a disturbing show, and I think that's why for me, it's such a good show. We pulled it off making the viewer feel uneasy. I even found it a difficult show to watch. Yeah, it was a pretty dark hour of television and I would like to do more of those. Producers originally wanted to shoot the opening of the episode at a Catholic hospital, but for one reason or another, the hospital said no because they didn't want the producers attaching a fake gargoyle to the side of their building. Instead, they decided to shoot at Heritage Hall in Vancouver. It's odd that the hospital wouldn't want a fake gargoyle on their building considering many old churches have them, so it's not like it would be disrespectful to the faith. Grotesque statues were often placed on the sides or roofs of buildings as a means of warding off evil. They could be some kind of mythological creature or even be human, but despite generally being attached to something like a church or cathedral, their designs rarely had anything to do with the religion itself. Chimera grotesques are statues depicting a combination of animals or humans, and gargoyle grotesques specifically refer to grotesques that have a spout in order to drain water away from the building. They can really take on any design though, like this Xenomorph Grotesque for example. Grotesque has a few guest stars, with one being very notable. First we have Levon Yuchaneshvili, and I'm sure I butchered his name, as John Mostow. He's usually credited just as Levani, because I guess for most his last name is just too hard to pronounce. Levin is a Russian, Georgian, and American actor, usually being hired on to play some Russian bad guy. This was only his third ever American role and he decided to shave his head and lose 10 pounds to give his character a more deranged appearance. He does a good job for the most part and comes off as pretty believable as the demented John Mostow. Levon is probably best known as playing one of the terrorists in the hit film Air Force One. Kurtwood Smith played Agent Bill Patterson. His character was inspired by former FBI John Edward Douglas, a man who was largely considered to be one of the very first criminal profilers. Kurtwood Smith is an American actor and does a really good job as Agent Patterson. It's nice when you have an actor of his caliber because it really helps elevate the entire production. He's been acting in stage productions, TV, and film for over 40 years, and obviously, unless you've been living under a rock, he's definitely best remembered as Red Foreman on the hit sitcom That 70s Show. It's kind of interesting that the previous episode also had a cast member from that same show. Even though that 70s show may be his most memorable role, my personal favorite is Clarence Boddicker in the badass Paul Verhoeven film, Robocop. He most recently can be found in that 90s show, but the less said about that, the better. Grotesque currently sits at 7.3 on IMDb, but I think it's a little better than that. It's creepy and makes you use your brain a bit, which I know most these days, especially with mind-numbing things like TikTok, don't really know how to do anymore. So for that, I'm giving it 8 bitches leave out of 10. Bitches leave. <coughs> Next up, we're back into the mythology when the agents get involved with a sunken World War II aircraft and a mysterious black oil in the episode Piper Maru. So what do you think of Grotesque? Does it deserve more credit than it gets or is it perfectly mediocre? Let me know down in the comments. Thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. I hope you're doing well and as always, stay spooky.
Have you ever felt a sudden fear sweep over you while walking past a gargoyle? No! Death was caused by massive blood loss due to facial mutilation. This Friday, you'll know why. Whatever keeps killing those young men wasn't a person. The X-Files. Ah! A brand new episode Friday at 9, 8 central.